Up today, we have our first returning guest on the Speed of Culture podcast. So excited to have Dr. Marcus Collins back, an award-winning marketer and cultural translator and marketing professor at the Ross School of Business. And most importantly, Marcus has a new book out called For the Culture that we're going to talk about today. Marcus, so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining our first repeat guest on the Speed of Culture. I feel so honored. I feel like this is like the Saturday Night Live return host sort of thing. I feel so honored. Look at me. That's the first time. Absolutely. Happened to speed of culture. It's happening right now. Well, I have to say the last time we were on the pod, I really didn't want it to end. And when I said I wanted to have you back after the book was out, I meant it. And here we are. The book comes out May 2nd, if I'm correct. That's right. That's so, right. May um, 2nd. This is what they say. Uh, promises made, promises kept. Here right. we go. <laughs> right. Your new book, For the Culture, it's now out. Tell us about the book and what the impetus behind For the Culture was. Yeah, so the book's out in the world. And, you know, the book has a very clear provocation. It's that there's no force, no external force, more influential to human behavior than culture, full stop. And now when you hear that, people go, yeah, I buy that. They nod their head. But if you ask five people to define culture, you get 25 different answers. That's a problem. If we don't have clear language, a good Rosetta Stone to describe a thing, we can never operationalize it. So for a company, for a marketer, a leader, institution, organization, politician, activist, we can never really harness the power of culture without good language. So the book sort of unpacks what is culture and then why does it have this impact on us and how do we leverage it in our day-to-day lives or in our practice? And it was really brought to bear by two things. One is from a practical perspective and the other one is personal. Practically, I thought, oh man, as a marketer, our job is to influence behavior. And if culture is the most influential force on human behavior, then this is the biggest cheat code, understanding culture. If we can find a better way to describe it and to harness its power, then we could be more powerful in using it. Awesome. From a personal level, I thought about this because I didn't have language to describe culture but I was very much affected by it, by most of us. So I'm from Detroit, born and raised, did well in math and science. And in those days, in the 90s, if you did well in math and science and you're black, you're going to be an engineer, full stop. Right. So that's what I studied. I studied engineering because that's what you were supposed to do. Those were the expectations of people like me. So I went to school to study engineering at the University of Michigan, studied material science engineering, realized it wasn't for me, but kept doing it because... That's what I thought I was supposed to do. I was getting social pressures from my family, from my parents, from my peers even, that this is what people like us do. And I did it begrudgingly, finished it, and went into a career I really wanted to do, music, and had to fight to make that happen too. And what I realized 20 some odd years later is that because I didn't know what was happening to me, that I was experiencing the forces of culture telling me to be normal, I didn't have very much agency to navigate it. And having wrote this book or written this book, I think to myself, wow, like not only does this help me as a better practitioner, but also help me as a better human Yeah, to make better decisions because I have agency to identify what's happening to me so I can now respond to it accordingly. Absolutely. And writing a book about culture, as you mentioned, it's such a big topic mm-hmm. and it really is the driving force of, of brand building and so much of what happens in the business world. Where do you start? In terms of, because it's such a broad topic, culture, how do you, in terms of the process of writing a book, which maybe will give our listeners a little idea in terms of what goes on inside your brain, how do you frame that topic into actually a form factor of a book? It was pretty difficult, actually. So I knew I wanted to write about culture and the impact that it has on us as human beings, as consumers and, and the like. So when I started writing the book, I just kind of kind of put everything on paper that I knew about culture and how I've leveraged it in my work. And I realized that I didn't have that much to say, (laughs) you know, like 5,000 words, which a book is more like 75 to 90,000 words, only had 5,000 words written about it. And I was like, oh man, I'm kind of tapped out here. And I thought to myself, well, I can write about this and I can write about that, but that's well-worn territory. Like people a thousand times smarter than me have already written that. What do I have to contribute uniquely? So I thought about So how do I see the world? Like, who am I as an individual? And how does that inform how I think about culture? And I thought about how culture was first studied by the social scientists in sociology, Durkheim, Weber, Marx. They observed religion to study culture. And I'm a church boy, for sure. I grew up in a church. And I was Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's a point of view that is uniquely mine. 
So I started looking at culture through that lens, but through a contemporary version of like the things I listen to, the cultural product that I take in. And it's that intersection of practice, academia, some sort of like uh, religion, if you will, and the cultural product that I take in as far as like film, literature, music, et cetera, and finding the convergence to talk about culture through that lens and the work that I've done, the research that I've done as an academic, as a scholar, that has created a, a new way for me to talk about it. And I started hearing from people like Doug Holt, who is a monster in, in my field, studies culture and, and strategy for marketers. He was like, you created a new lane for this thing. And I was like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so getting there, it was a challenge but it's that introspection of like who I am and how I see the world that allowed me to add something new to the discourse about culture and its impact on consumption. Yeah, and culture is something that's really ever-changing, right? Mm -hmm. And as somebody who wrote a book 10 years ago, and I'm about to go in and actually write a post about some of the predictions I made 10 years later in terms of like what was right Ooh, and wrong. What hold up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think I did okay. But, you know, ultimately since culture is changing so quickly and a, board, a book is a static form factor, did that drive your thought in terms of, hmm, if I put this in the book, is it going to be irrelevant in a year or so? And in that regard, what in the book do you think will be true 10 years from now? Mm -hmm. And what do you worry might be, or even five years from now, what do you worry might be dated? Yeah, I think, so when it comes to like the temporality, uh, the femorality of the things that are written in the book, I used examples that were from my work and that those things for me are evergreen because it's my work okay. and it's that. So let's practice. unpack those. What is evergreen? Right. So human behavior, right? Technology changes really, 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 really fast. Culture can change quickly. At least fast culture can change very quickly. Trends, things like that. Exactly. Yeah. But people change very, 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 very slowly very slowly. Like, we're still using the same hardware from our sub-Saharan African days, right? Like, the software may update, but the hardware is still very much the same. So if people change slowly and trends and technology change quickly, then let's focus on people. So when I talk about the impact of culture, I look at the underlying physics that govern us as humanity and then use these examples from work that I've done, work before me as well, as context of how these things play out to actually say, hey, the things that work back with like World of War Worlds, same thing that worked with Blair Witch Project, the same thing that worked today with like the Chris Paul campaign, the Cliff Paul campaign for State Farm, that these things are evergreen because humanity doesn't change that quickly. And if we understand humanity, then we can leverage those things. So what does the future bring? Or what is the future, if I were to be a clairvoyant, which I'm not, I would say that like, it's what Marshall McLuhan said, that technology will always extend human behavior, but it's going to be bound by human behavior. So while will TikTok be a thing 10 years from now? Who knows? Twitter doesn't look, doesn't look good. Right, right. <laughs> but people will still be people. And if we understand people, the things that are happening beneath the surface, not just things that we observe, then we can leverage those understandings to inform and impact what happens on the surface. This is why I talk to I talk to students and clients about the idea of trend spotting. Trend spotting can be powerful. We're looking at how people consume, what are they doing, what are they taking on, what are their, their perceptions and attitudes about a particular thing today. But those things change quickly. It's ephemeral, right? Yeah, yeah. What I'm more concerned about is what are the underlying things that are informing that? What are the implicit meanings that don't change as quickly that informs why they want to demonstrate themselves as such? It's like, it's like flying over New York City. You know, I can see the patterns. I can see this is uh, Central Park. Here's Times Square. Here's Meatpacking. Here's Murray Hill. I don't know why I thought of Murray Hill. <laughs> but here, here are these different places. But you don't know the city until you walk the streets, until you talk to people. And you really don't know the city until you know how it moves, the subway system. Yeah. And what is the system for humanity? It's culture, the things that happen beneath the surface. So I think that for the future, prayerfully, the book holds up because it's about people. Right. What are some examples are sort of the evergreen human behavioral aspects that drive culture? That is probably the most salient thing in all of us is that we, as Aristotle says, we are by nature social animals. 
We want to connect. Anthropologists would argue that the reason why we were able to evolve as a species was our ability to cooperate, to socialize, to come together. It's deep in our brainstem to be connected. And all we want to do is to connect, to belong, to find people like ourselves, to find community. It's in our DNA to be communal, to, to belong. That thing will never, never change. And interestingly, as you and your friend walked down the street and saw this happening, they, they were like, what's going on here? And like, oh, they're celebrating. That's what you observe. What's happening beneath the surface? They want to belong, but also for a Knicks fan, it's been a long time since you've been there. Struggle, that's a struggle. Exactly. This is the victory that we've all been waiting for. We haven't had that kind of celebration since Lynn Sanity, (laughs) like 10 years ago. Like, like, so these things have meaning beneath the surface. And that's the other part. We we want to be in tribes, in in communal, in community. And the way we do that is by the way we collectively make meaning, the way we see the world, the way we translate the world. Because Everything that we see around us is inherently meaningless, means nothing. Like everything that we're looking at right now has no meaning inherently to it. We give it meaning. For instance, red. What is red? One would say it's a color. One may say it's a wavelength that activates your eyes to see a color. But if you're driving down the street and you approach a red light, red means stop. Yeah. Does red inherently mean stop? No. But we have negotiated and constructed that red means stop, just like green means go and yellow means hurry up. (laughs) These things don't inherently mean these things. We give it that meaning. Red means passionate. It means hot. It means sexy. It means angry. But some things are, I guess, espoused onto you and other things you know right away. For example, we both have small children. That's right. When we ask, you know, our two and three-year-olds what color and they say red, they're probably just looking at it in terms of the definition of red. But over time as we get older through our experiences and we know that red means stop or red means makes you feel young or whatever the, you know, that whatever emotion the color brings out within you. That's right. But that changes over time. And I would imagine culture has a big impact on that definition exactly. over time. So we interpolate on our children what meaning is. Right. Through folklore, through stories that we tell, through music that we hear. This is all cultural product to socialize what people like us do. Like, you know, you go back to religion. If you're anywhere, any modicum of religion you've had, you learn it by stories, right? So we tell stories through folklore to our young so they know how to be good citizens, how to be like us. And what happens is that we get introduced to new ideas and we start to develop new meaning. And we go, mm, I don't know if I see it like that anymore. And then we say, I, I don't like hanging out with my family because we don't make meaning the same way. Or we have a different cultural lens by which we see the world, right? So we want to belong. And how we belong is by having a shared point of view, a shared way of seeing the world. So if you think about culture as this system of conventions and expectations, it's anchored in our identity. Yeah. Like I'm a Collins or we're New Yorkers. Right. Or for those who live in New York. So I'm a Collins. We have a set of or a political affiliation. Or I'm a Republican. I'm a Democrat. I'm a Wyden Kennedy or yeah. I'm a Michigan Wolverine. Whatever our identity sets in, I am this. And because I self-identify by this collective, right, especially when I subscribe my identity, not ascribe, like our children are ascribed their identity. They are Collins because they were born in the Collins family. But our subscriptions are, I choose to join this company. I choose to join this fraternity. I choose to go to this school. I choose to purchase this brand. Exactly. And I ascribe my identity to it. So because I am this thing, there are a set of beliefs and ideologies that are expected of people like us. So to be a good standing citizen in this community that we so desperately in our DNA want to be a part of, I adhere to the beliefs and ideologies, the truths and the stories that I tell myself about being a part of this community. And because I see the world a certain way, I show up in the world a certain way. I dress a certain way, right? New Yorkers wear black. We're all wearing black in this room. (laughs) New Yorkers wear black. I behave a certain way. There's certain norms or expectations. There's language that we use, vernacular that we use. Like we have a shared way of living. So I know that you're one of us, right? I know how you talk, that you're one of us. By what you wear, I go, oh, you must be X, Y, and Z. People walk fast. They don't always hold open a door for That's you. Right. It's a little different right. than it is exactly. in different parts of the country. Exactly. Like if, some, if I'm talking to someone and they're like, oh, what's happening, son? I'm like, you're from, you're from New York. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. But if I meet someone, they go, what up, though? It's like, oh, you're from Detroit. Or if someone goes, man, that John, oh, you're from Philly, right? That language signals where you're from. And people subscribe their identity to where they're from, or they say, I'm from this little town in X, Y, and Z, but that's not who I am. My identity is now here. 
I subscribe my identity elsewhere. And because of our identity, we share a same way of seeing the world, a same way of life, and then we have a shared expression of being that. The music we listen to, the art we take in, the literature that we read, the music that the, the movies that we watch, the television that we watch, and the brands and branded products that we consume. True, but here's the thing I struggle with with that is like Nike, sure, Adidas, sure. They are brands that fit so well into culture. Feminine care products, you know, bottled water. Where do they fit in within culture? And how do brands that aren't the cool brands approach culture as a driver for their business? So what makes a brand cool? What makes a brand cool is that it's something that I aspire to or something that is aligned with who I am. Sure. I mean, the, talk about Nike, like, they're sneakers. Like, there's a commodity. But there's, they still look cool. They still have the swoosh. Like, a feminine care product is not something that people would aspire but to. But what makes something look cool? For instance, when I first saw the Yeezys, I was like, these shoes are terrible. <laughs> they just look ugly as all get out. And people are like, they're just so comfortable. Like, they look like moths on your feet. They're not cool. I own four pair of them. Why? Why? Yeah. Because people like me do something like this. We collectively make meaning. Why is this kind of music good versus that? Why is that style cool and that not? Like we collectively legitimate it through the discourse that we take in, the conversations that we have. So a commodity that is meaningless has but meaning. What about a low bombing category? What about toothpaste? What so, about shampoo? So let's let's go yeah. to something a little less sexy sure. in nature, right? Or less conspicuous. Yes. Right. Like let's talk water. Okay. I don't think anything can be more commoditized than water, at least in the Western world, right? We have access. Tremendous access to clean water, depending on where you are. There's Aquafina, there's Dasani, there's Fiji. Voss. It's, yeah, Voss. All these brands, yep. it's all water, H2O, right? But we pay a premium because of what it means in our minds. What's a cool water brand? Liquid Death. Liquid Death has a point of view about the world, right? That they want to kill plastic and they want to murder your thirst. Instead of being in a plastic bottle, it's in a tall boy can. And having a tall boy can says not about me that I am distinctive, that I am ar- ironic. I go to the gym and I got a tall boy. People are like, what are you doing? Right? I think that the VP of marketing once said that like, like we want to be the SNL of marketing. Like that we're, like we're bringing in these sort of, these pokes and prods that really kind of takes the piss out of what we consider to be the, the status quo. And as a result, H2O in this can from this brand has different meaning. And if I rock a shirt that says liquid death, it says something about who I am. Just like back in the day, if you rocked a shirt that said Red Bull, it says something about who you are. Dove sells hand soap, body conditioner, wash. Yeah. body wash, these inconspicuous things. But we share things from Dove because what Dove believes, how it sees the world, its ideology and its cultural characteristics are aligned with us. We believe in encouraging, empowering self-esteem. Right. And so to share a video from from Dove is like, I agree with this thing, not because of what Dove is, but because of who I am. And we use these brands as identity marks. And as we use them as identity marks, we go, Matt, I was thinking the exact same thing when I saw that. Oh, my goodness. And it brings us together. So us sharing these cultural products, the, the, these whether it's product good product services from brands or mar- marketing communications, there are ways by which we communicate who we are to go find people like us. Always feminine hygiene, right? Very inconspicuous in its usage. And traditional feminine hygiene products have communicate themselves as such. Here's ours. Here's the competitor. Here's red water in ours. Here's blue water in theirs. Ours absorb more by ours. Right. A unique value selling proposition. proposition. Yep. Value proposition base totally. But always goes, well, what do we believe as a company, as a brand, right? We believe that women are awesome, right? And what they saw in the literature is that By adolescence, both boys and girls, their self-esteem plummets. But then boys' self-esteem jumps right back up. And girls just kind of peter up over time. Yeah. And always says, that's ridiculous. Why is that a thing? So, well, because of the rhetoric that we use when we talk about girls. Doing things like a girl. You run like a girl. You fight like a girl. You hit like a girl. As if being a girl is something to be diminished as if that's something that's not to be celebrated. So what did it always do? They did a campaign that kind of poked at these cultural norms, this rhetoric, this language that we use in our society that's actually taking a punch, giving a black eye to, to women. This is ridiculous. So they make this film 
people shared it massively, not because of its products, but because of what the brand believes is aligned with what they believe. And like sales went up for a product that is commoditized. Right. And we talked about this during the last pod, but like the Toyota Camry would be looked at as a technological marvel 20 years ago. It can get you from New York to California comfortably, safely, et cetera. So we're at the point in so many categories where the unique selling propositions are almost at parity. Exactly. Right? So, so what's going to differentiate you? It's brand. What drives brand culture? Think of like water. Water is H2O. We'll say it has electrolytes, fam. It's water. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or, or like salt. Salt has the therapeutic index of sodium chloride. It's NaCl. That's all. That's what salt is. But then, but there's coconut water. There's a lot of products that are just that. It is what. So product wise, side by side, they're often parity, right? But what allows it to transcend the value propositions of the product and charge a premium in many instances? Because Hermes, Louis Vuitton, I see myself in it, right? It is an identity project for me. It's a strategy by which I signal to the world who I am so I can find people who are just like me. There's nothing more uh, satisfying for me than when I travel and I see someone with the Michigan paraphernalia yeah. on and I go, go blue, and they go, go blue. And I feel like I'm connected. Even when I'm overseas, and I see someone rocking Michigan gear and they say, go blue, and I go, go blue. Man, I got someone everywhere. It, in my brain, it triggers that you are safe. Because there's people in this world to which you are connected to, even if you don't know it. Yeah, I walk by people with an Eagles hat or shirt, and I'm like, go birds. Like, go birds. I give them a fist bump. Exactly. No idea who Strangers. they are. Strangers. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting part. When I'm on Michigan's campus where, where, where I teach, I don't say go blue to everybody who's wearing, wearing the gear. Even though we're all wearing Michigan paraphernalia on the campus, we don't do that when we're there. We do that when we're away. Right. These signals are a way that we tell people in this world where everyone's outside different. outside of that one community this we belong in this big exactly. world there's something that we have in common and that's all we really want what's interesting is that brands when you talk about unique selling proposition you know 30 percent more absorbent 350 horsepower whatever it may be that's right that was in a world where brands marketed by cookie cutter demographics 18 to 24 you know 34 to 49 because they thought that people of a certain maybe gender or income level or age right are, actually we're all the same. And what I'm hearing from you when you talk about go blue, that's psychographics. That's not demographics. So is that how it's all one way it's all changed? I would take it one step higher. It's identity. Yeah. Which is the anchor of culture. People I mean, don't identify by their age though. They identify by their passions. Listen, if some, we, we look at demography and we use that all the time to describe people and it is efficient, but terribly inaccurate. Yeah. So take my demography. At the time of this recording, I'm 44 years old. I'm black from Detroit, born and raised, and went to public schools my entire life. If a marketer saw that on a brief, they'll go, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, hang out with those kind of people because that's just what those kind of people do. Right. And that sounds crazy racist for me to say out loud, but that's what we do it's the easy thing. all the it's time. Cookie cutter. It's we easy. We put people in boxes, not because it's real, but because it's easy. Deborah drives a minivan. Does Deborah have kids? Yep. Does Deborah, uh, do her kids play sport? Yep. What sport do they play? Soccer. Where does she live? The suburbs. One data point about Deborah, we map out our entire life. We do this all the time, not because it's real, but because it's easy. While I am 44, I am black, I am from Detroit, I did go to public schools my entire life. I also played jazz growing up and I swam competitively and I studied engineering and I love the monkeys as much as I love a tribe called Quest. These things shape how I see the world my truths and ideologies about the world, and therefore, I show up in the world a certain way, and therefore, I consume a certain way. So when we think about it from that perspective, we go, oh, demography is trash, trash. But we look at people based on their cultural subscription, not only is it a more accurate to describe them because they self-identify by it, but also there's probably some predictive outcomes that happen because of what people like us exactly. do. I mean, it's, 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 I, t I tell my students this all the time. It's like, you know, we say all women love to shop. That's not true, right? Or I hear MBA students go, you know, all guys are dogs. They go, no, your boyfriend's a dog. <laughs> <laughs> all guys are dogs, right? It's like, you know, all black people do something fill in the blank racist. Like, it's ridiculous. But we say just because you were born in a 20-year period, you're the same. That is nonsensical. But we do it all the time and we bet the farm on it. Not because it's real, but because it's easy. It's so true. I mean, you know, I spent 20 years in the advertising industry. I can't tell you how many times the CMO would say, 
our ICP, ideal customer profile, is Jane. Jane is 34 years old. She right. lives in Minneapolis. Her you know, her household income is blank. That's right. And this is what Jane likes. Jane watches this stuff. So we're going to put these ads on, et cetera. That's and right. it's like, that is not differentiating, right? Is, right? is that where brands go wrong in terms of trying to ingratiate in the culture and build a brand in this new era? Brands go wrong because we don't understand people. And the paradox is that we have more data than ever before, but we don't know who people truly are because we mistake information for intimacy. Right. We have to understand people. W.E.D. Du Bois puts it this way, that herein lies the tragedy of the age. Not that men are poor because we all know something about poverty. Not that men are wicked because what is good. Not that men are liars because what is truth? Nay, that we know so little of mankind. We don't know people outside ourselves. So it requires us to be much more empathetic, taking off our lens or how we make meaning through our cultural meaning making system. That is the way we see the world and see the world through other people's eyes. Not to, not to agree, but to understand, right? Like I'm not a Republican, but I'll look at Fox News and I go, I get why they feel the way they feel. I don't agree. I don't think it's right, but I get it, right? And I like, you know, I manage a team of people and I'll hear someone complain about a thing and I go, well, that's not what I said, but I understand why they feel that way, right? It's just about understanding and the better we understand people, the more likely we are to activate them, the more likely we are to connect with them in meaningful ways that not only get them to move, but also get them to evangelize on our behalf with people who are just like them. And people trust people more than any form of marketing communications. Like I watch shows because someone was like, yo, there's a show on Paramount Plus. You've got to watch Marcus. I go, oh, what is it? Oh, it's called Yellowstone. And I'm like, oh, I saw that commercial. It's like country, like you Western. You put it in the box. Like, right? I don't, I don't, that, that, that's not me. I don't do that. And they go, no, no, dude, let me tell you. Like, it's this, that, and the third, and it's this. And they go, oh, sweet. I watched it, not because of the ad, because someone told me, right? And like you said, I put it in the box. And like, I'm not that person. There are more people who watch Game of Thrones than people who subscribe as sci-fi fans. Why? Because those people who were hardcore Game of Thrones fans went to go preach the gospel. That's what we got to do as marketers. Find people who see the world the way we do. And they tell people about us, not because of what it is, but because of who they are. Yeah. The brand becomes an identity mark, a receipt of their identity. And they share with people within their subculture and people within that community act, not because of what it is, but because of who they are. Absolutely. It's interesting because I'm thinking as you talk about the ad world and just the go-to-market strategy being a little bit of a barbell because what you're talking about is essentially brand building, mm -hmm. you know, and at the same time, there's a lot of performance marketing, which is you have to get, you know, customer acquisition costs at a certain number and it's like the math behind business. When you're looking at the math behind business, you sometimes it's easy to throw all that out the window sure. and say, I'm just going to focus on discounts, deals, offers. That's right. So where does that fit in? Because it, it's a completely different approach. It's a false binary that we create. It's like, I either have to think about right now or the future. Right. And why do those things have to be at odds? Like, that's a false bifurcation, right? What we know from the literature, look at uh, Benet and Field's IPA work, is that strong brands build when we think about the sales activation today, the short term, and the brand building for tomorrow. Like, uh, Professor Base and Professor Rock said it takes two to make a thing go right, right? Rob Bass, DJ Easy Rock. Like, yep. it takes two to make a thing go right. You need the short term and the long term. And I think that we as brands, stewards, we don't think in that way. We I mean, there's some perverse incentives for us to think about right now. I have to make my numbers by the end of the quarter or I'll lose my job or whatever. We're chasing our stock price as a way of, of a metric of how we're performing. But ultimately, we're in the business of getting people to move. And when we think about our activations, they should all perform. The brand should perform. The brand work should perform just like the quote unquote performance marketing should perform. They just happen at a different time horizon, right? Like, you know, if I, if I meet someone, say I meet a girl on the street and I say, hey, you know, I'd love to take you for coffee, right? I'm not like, I'm paying for coffee right now so that this happens next. Like, no, I'm making an investment for my, what might be the future. And this is what we do with brand building. We are establishing relationships. We are trying to, to construct meaning in the minds of people so that they move over time. When we're doing discounts, we are activating the prefrontal cortex, the dopamine shots to help people move right now today. Yeah. But doing the two together 
gets us both the long-term view and a short-term view that's better for the business. It lets people act with confidence. They might act instantly, but they're acting with confidence because they have a preconceived notion or feeling about the brand that's right. that they have an emotional connection that's right. to. I mean, a brand, by definition, is a signifier. It means something. It's identifiable signifier that conjures up thoughts and feelings in the minds or hearts of people relative to a product, a company, institution, organization, or, or a person. person. Yeah. Exactly, or a person. Like, that's what a brand is. It means something. So when I see the brand mark, I'm flooded with cognitions and affects, right? Like my mind is flooded with thoughts and my emotions are overflowing when it's a strong brand. But when I see it, I go, oh, that's just 20 Five percent more fluoride in my toothpaste, not a strong it's brand. It's so interesting because I, in many instances of my career, struggle with having to evolve what my company was known for. For example, I first started my company as Mr. Youth and we did college oh, tours. Oh yeah, no, Mr. Youth. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and then what I realized is, oh, we're just a vendor. We need to get more upstream. We need to get the CMO. And over time, I had to shed people's conceived, preconceived notions about what my business did. That's right. And it could be strategic. And over time, we ended up renaming as MRY. We had to shift positioning. And now even with Susie, when we first started, we were like an on-demand quick research tool. Yeah. But then we wanted to be more sophisticated, so we yeah. hired more people in. But there are still some people that looked at us as who we were, That's right. not who we are. So it's hard to change you th in terms of like first impressions of people. Sure. How do brands go about evolving their identity if, you know, if it's such a process to get there? So let's, let's take you, for instance. So from your time in Mr. Youth all the way to today at Susie, I would say those things that you have done, it's what you've done in these different incarnations and it's presented itself differently. But why you've done it has always remained the same. In my mind, yeah. like this is me outside yeah. looking in, when I think about the meaning of who that is, that you've always been curious about people, observing people and understanding the things that make them tick. And as Mr. Youth, you created campaigns that activated them because you were so close to them in proximity. And now you have a platform that gets close to people through market research. Right. You are activating at the same ideological level, just different executions. Take a person, a different person, Beyonce. Mm -hmm. She's an artist. The way Beyonce sang in the music she made with Destiny's Child is different than the way she sings in the music she makes today. But Beyonce believes in women's empowerment. And she's been that way since she told us, no, 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 yep. pay my bills, survivor uh, to the left, who runs the world, girls, get in formation, you're gonna break my soul. Like she has been consistent in her ideology. She just manifested differently over time. Nike, at least since the days of Kenny, that that's all I know, said Nike believed that every human body is an athlete. It believes that every human body is an athlete, big, small, short, tall, you're, you're an athlete. The sneakers that they may have changed over time. Yeah. The way it communicated itself has changed over time. The context changes, but the ideology, the belief remains the same. And I think that's how, why we have to transcend the value propositions of what we do to think about why we do it in the words of Simon Sinek. It's our ideology that allows us to connect. When people see the world the way we do, we go, oh, that's my people. Yeah. I trust them. Right? They have meaning in my mind beyond what they do. That's right. And because of why they exist, why uh, uh, they show up in the world, their ideology, their conviction, they can do whatever they want to do. They're not confined by a category as long as they are demonstrating their conviction, their ideology. Right. You said something earlier in this conversation about how the world around people is changing quicker than humanity itself. And that, you know, sometimes even though you see things differently externally, people are still people. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I would challenge on that is that that is generally true, but we've had these huge waves throughout society of technological innovation, whether mm -hmm. it be the printing press, aviation, Absolutely. you know, the, the telephone, the internet, new media, and now artificial intelligence, yes. right? To me, I see this as the next big technological wave. Totally. When those waves happen, from where I sit, I actually have seen human change because if you look at the Arab Spring or you look at the insurrection that happened, the, like, those things that happened would not have happened without social media. So they, by nature, have changed the way oh, people yeah. have acted. So how do you kind of reckon that? And how do you see this new change of AI impacting the way humans change and yeah. a lot of the things that we're talking about? It goes back to Marshall McLuhan. Technology merely extends human behavior. Right. It's the extension of what we've always done. And that extension has different or implications. accelerates too. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. So I think about, I went to my 20-year high school reunion a, a few years back. 
And when I went to the reunion, I thought this was going to be like everything I've seen on television. I'm going to go to my reunion. People will be like, Marcus, oh my goodness, I haven't seen you since forever. What have you been up to? Blah, blah, blah. Fill me in. Because every show, every movie I've watched when people went to back to their high school reunion, that's what it was like. <laughs> yeah. right? I'm going to go impress everybody because I haven't seen everybody in forever. That's not how my reunion was because we had Facebook and right. Instagram and Twitter. So when I showed up to my high school reunion with my because wife. You were just in Florida, daughter. right? Like, you exactly. Know, right? They were like, tell me about your vacation. And I just saw the pictures. They looked amazing. Oh my goodness, Georgia, you look just like you look on the photos. <laughs> it extends human behavior. Years ago, we wouldn't be that connected because there will be a decay. There's a natural decay in relationships where you're not physically close to each other or constantly in contact. But these technologies extend that. So therefore, our behavior is different. So technologies do that, just like the wheels extensions of the foot allow us to go further. And because of that, we were able to uh, to make bikes, which turned into vehicles, which gave us highways. It got us big box retail and suburbs. Like there are implications because of this extension, but it's all based on a, a fundal human human thing. Glasses are extensions of the eyes. Clothes are extensions of the skin. Cameras are extensions of the memory. Uh, computers are extensions of the brain. And in the same way social networking platforms are extensions of our real life social networks. Yeah. So these technologies, they, they move us forward, but they're still grounded in the humanity that is us. What about AI, which is creating, it's, and some people believe it's a new version of humanity. Like, how do you think AI is going to impact society? And if we're talking a year from now, which I think you'll probably be our first three-time guest on the <laughs> podcast, um, what do you think we'll be saying about it a year from now in terms of AI's impact on, on culture specifically? So I'm not clairvoyant. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do think that we may be inflating sure. AI just a little bit, right? And we, we tend to do this, right? We can hype up things more. Blockchain, than, we had it happen last oh, year. Oh, goodness, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, we just destroyed NFTs. NFTs could actually have been a cool thing, but we destroyed it by inflating what cycle. it was, as opposed to just kind of appreciating what it is right now. I mean, AI has some promise that could be helpful. I mean, it's helpful right now, right? If I want to write something, I don't want to stare at a blank page, AI kind of gives me a little bit of, uh, ChatGPT gives me a little bit of inspiration. I, I don't do that, but I can see one doing that very thing. If I want to get quickly studied on a on a topic, ChatGPT, AI can give you a good good understanding of that. But AI isn't great right now. I mean, I don't know if you've seen like photos of people. It's cool they can make those photos of people who are not real. But when you look closer, they got like 85 Six teeth, fingers. seven yeah. <laughs> fingers. Like it's not great right now. But it could be great in, in three months. The, it could the rate be. of change. It yeah. totally could be. So overextend its possibilities. I think it's unfair to what it could be. So I'd say like right now, it's an interesting technology. Yeah. And I think that what we should do, like we do with all things that are exogenous shocks to the system, let's engage it. Let's, let's see what it does. Let's kick, kick the tires. And it's going to suck today and it's going to be better tomorrow and better a year, a year out. Will it be all that it could be? Maybe not. I mean, the internet wasn't that. When the internet first came out in the, 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 the 90s, people were like, what is this thing? Yeah, and we had this the is big ridiculous. Bus with Pets.com and all that. Why right? would I ever need to go online? I just go to my own, to the store, blah, blah, blah. It didn't make any sense. And then people rushed to it. Big balloon, it bursts. And then people were like, see, I told you this was a dud. Now here we are, 30 years later, the internet well, is so a, much a part a of our It's a classic lives. kind of innovation cycle where everybody jumps on it. The press talks about it. It's on the front page of the USA Today. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there becomes a, you know, a, a bus cycle. And then the real work begins. Exactly. And then ultimately it becomes, because you need consumer behavior to catch up. You need the applications to really be something that consumers want to adopt. Exactly. And then when society is finally ready, exactly. then it becomes. I mean, this goes back to the idea of culture, that it's the meaning that we ascribe to it. When the internet first came out, the people who were in the press, the journalists who were writing about it, they were giving meaning to it because we didn't know what it was. Yeah. And the meaning they gave to it was somewhat superficial. It was, it was somewhat... Well, the meaning they gave to it helped them sell papers. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's, so why, gave, that's why you see a lot of fear. AI is going to take over the world because it drives fear. And that fear will make people... It's clickbait, basically. You said it better than I ever could. One thousand percent. Like, when the meaning is owned by someone who is not the original sort of creators of it, the meaning begins to shift away. I mean, this is what we would call cultural appropriation in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah. That we take the meaning from the makers of the thing, the people who create these these markers of their cultural subscription and give it new meaning. Well, we've seen that happen with, like, with like Black Lives Matter, right? It the was wokeness. Yeah. The idea of woke, it, it goes far back as like Marcus Garvey, right? He wrote a paper about like, you know, uh, wake up Jamaica, right? This is about returning 
black people to our homeland, to, to Africa. Like he was very, very much a proponent of that. And wokeness had been a part of the dominant black culture for years. Spike Lee told us, wake up. And, you know, a couple of years back, Childish Gambino said, now stay woke. Like everything was yeah. about wake up. That was a part of our lexicon. But then the Fox News of the world conquested that language and gave it new meaning. And now it's like, oh, wokeness, oh, wokeness. Like, but that's not what it was. So when meaning gets co-opted and gets perverted, right, that is a form of cultural appropriation in in many, many ways. Especially when it's done by those with a megaphone that can shift the popular opinion of something. Or said differently when it's come by with people who have power. Cultural appropriation is not about race. It's about power. People with power take the cultural markers from a community, a marginalized community mostly, and then give it new It's meaning. so interesting because before there was Spotify or YouTube, that happened with music where they would take, you know, a young female singer and they would say, you know what, we're going to, we're going to sell sex through this. So we're going to basically take your look and actually morph it for a way where we can get you on heavy rotation, top 40, clear channel. Right. We're going to take away your real meaning behind music. And the artists didn't have a choice because it's the only way to get out there. But now with Spotify, YouTube, all these tools, SoundCloud, people can be more real and authentic. That's, and there's the technology extending human behavior. Yeah. We want to be ourselves. We, right. We want, like, we connect with people when we are our authentic It unlocked selves. Our, our truer selves. It exactly. allowed people to be authentic. I mean, and this is actually the power of social networking platforms. So my research... Uh, on the academic side, you know, I study uh, cultural contagion, how things spread within a cultural context, and how we make meaning. So meaning-making, cultural contagion is where I spend a lot of my time studying. And for the large part of my research, I use social social listening. There was, I observe people in their cultural contexts uh, practicing their cultural subscription. Where? Where do, where do you do? Reddit. I, just, I can't think of a place online. It's interesting because Reddit's just notoriously anonymous. But that's the powers that because people can act in anonymity, they're more likely to be sort of themselves. Yeah. And the most the they're beautiful not get part fired for their job or something. That's right. And the, canceled, the, the right. beautiful part about Reddit is that Reddit is a community of communities. Yeah. Right. And it's this huge front door made of many, many communities. And as a researcher, it's the perfect place because you have moderators cleaning the data for you. If you post things that are outside of the cultural characteristics, the conventions and expectations of that subreddit, it gets taken off. Or Throw you, down. as a member of that subreddit, you get kicked out. So someone's cleaning the data for you. So as a researcher, I go in and I'm looking at the discourse that's happening between people who subscribe their it's identity to a cultural community. And so I'm observing people's cultural practice in action, much like I were if I were an ethnographer going in the field, going to Comic-Con to watch people who do cosplay. It's unbelievably powerful. So I'm watching people make meaning, how they construct and negotiate meaning when these exogenous shocks to the system happen, new technologies, new products, new music, new headlines. So when it happens out in the world, they go to these platforms, and they talk to people like themselves and go, what do you think about this? And this is how we decide what is acceptable. The literature refers to this as uh, legitimation, the social process by which we decide what products, what behaviors, what, 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 ide what ideas are acceptable for people like us. Yeah. And it happens through the discourse. So observing the discourse, you can see how people are constructing meaning. Like it could, you could see a mile away that NFTs are going to have a problem because of how people were talking about NFTs sparked by what was happening in... You know what a great example is? So marijuana is legalized in New York City now, and that is a change in behavior. It used to be illegal. People That's used right. to go to jail for it. Right. Now it's legal. So you have very few legally you know, regulated marijuana shots. But then you see all these other places popping up. You see some people say, you know what, I'm going to smoke a joint in the middle of the street. That's right. Other people are like, no, there's still a taboo to it. Yes. So seeing kind of that dissonance yeah. with the public in terms of how they evolved towards this new legal standard. Right. It's fascinating. I write about this in, in the book. Take the, the the Oscars last year. So Will Smith slaps Chris Rock. Yep. Right? And we as a society, as a country go, whoa, what did we just see? Because that is not a normal thing for us. And the it's media appropriate normal. that right away, talking about clickbait. I mean, so we observe and we go, wow. I mean, some of us were like, that didn't even happen. It wasn't even really. Mm -hmm. It was just, it was such, it was such, a foreign thing to what is normal that we had to like actually get our minds around what just happened. So then the media starts to replay the thing for us, replay the evidence of what just took place. And then producers, writers start to write think pieces about it. And then we 
people start to jump into the discourse through social networking platforms, Twitter, Reddit, the like, discussing what it meant. Does it, some people said, look, it was just a joke. Will Smith needs to learn how to take a joke. People said, like, you should never hit anybody. Violence is never okay. Some people were like, look, my husband better protect me if someone talks about me that way. And as a researcher, I'm watching this saying, this is amazing because I'm watching the country make meaning. And ultimately what we were doing as we were weighing in our two cents, whether it was a joke via a meme or a very serious statement, like that's happened to me before, whatever the case may be, we were weighing in to decide, is this acceptable for us? Because culture moves forward on the basis of one simple question. Do people like me do something like this? The answer is yes, I do it. The answer is no, I don't. And we make the decision hundreds, if not thousands of times a day, whether we're conscious of it or not. So these platforms, we observe people doing this thing, these, these the, the, the discourse and the rhetoric in which they enter the discourse, we get an understanding of like how they see the world and collectively how they'll choose to navigate through the world. And as a marketer, unbelievably powerful because they do the same thing with your products. Hey, I saw this ad for X, Y, and Z. Well, what's it mean? Is this cool? Is this hip? Do we do this? You know, are we still listening to R. Kelly? Right. Uh, do we listen to the baby still? Like, is he canceled? Like, these things are being negotiated through the discourse that that we have. And observing that for a marketer, it's, it, it is, there's nothing more powerful than that. That's how we get to the intimacy Absolutely. that we need. So fascinating. Well, we're running out of time here. I mean, I cannot wait to dig deeper uh, into the book. Just to wrap up here. So what's next for you? So you, you wrote a book. I mean, what strikes me is that many people write a book because they want to be opportunistic in the moment. This seems like it's the thesis of everything you've been working on for so long. And I, I'm just so happy for you that you've been able to get it out in such a permanent form because a book is something that's going to be there that your kids are going to be able to show their kids one that's day. Right, and that's, that's right. the great thing about a book. What's next for you? What are you focused on next? And what do you hope people take away from the book uh, that they can really get value from? Ultimately, this is just about scaling the impact. You know, I believe my why, why I exist, my ideology, is I believe that I was put in this earth to serve. I feel like all of us put in this earth to serve. Sure. In my lens, to serve God and serve each other, right? That's what I'm here to do. And I think that the way I do that is by helping people realize their highest fidelity possible. And this book helps me scale that. So maybe you, you're you not the University of Michigan, you can't be in my classroom. Maybe you're not a client at Wine Kennedy, or maybe you're not at a conference where I'm giving a talk, but you can buy a book. And the hope is that the things I've learned, the mistakes that I've made, the provocations that I, that I have struggled with, and the epiphanies that I've had will help you make better decisions than I did so you'd be far better ahead, far better at this than I've, than I've been. And if I could do that, I feel like then uh, my living has not been in vain. Absolutely. And for those of you who are still listening, which I hope you are, to this amazing podcast, if you go to suzy.com slash for the culture, the first hundred people that register there will get a free copy of Marcus's new book, uh, Compliments of Susie. So uh, please be sure to do that as well, the first 100 people. So I want to uh, wrap it with that, Marcus. This has been amazing. I love having you on. I learned something new every single time and hope to have you back again. And uh, best of luck with the book. I'm sure it'll be a, a tremendous success. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate absolutely, it. absolutely. So on behalf of Susie and the Adweek team, thanks again to Dr. Marcus Collins, author of the book For the Culture, available anywhere books are sold. Be sure to check it out and grab a copy. And again, the first 100 people to go to suzy.com slash for the culture will get a free copy. Compliments of Susie. So thanks again for joining. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Till next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. The Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and Agast Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcast. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for The Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.